Today's lecture is on the chi-square test of association. This test is appropriate when you have two categorical variables. When each variable has exactly two categories, this test is equivalent to a test for a difference in proportions, similar to how the goodness of fit test is equivalent to a test for a single proportion when the one categorical variable has exactly two categories. Earlier this semester, we talked about the sleep study by Onyper, Thatcher, Gilbert, and Gratis in 2012. They collected data on 253 college students who kept a sleep diary recording their time and quality of sleep over a two-week period. These students completed a skills test and surveys to measure their cognitive function, attitudes, and habits. Two variables that were measured were the student's sex and their alcohol use. We may be interested in whether there's a relationship between sex and alcohol use, such that one sex might be more likely to be a heavier drinker than another. A bar chart of alcohol use by sex is shown on this slide. Each column in this figure corresponds to a sex, and each color within a bar to a category of alcohol use. Notice that the heights of the bars are different, indicating more females participated in the study than males, and that the total number as well as the proportion of heavy drinkers is higher for males than females. This indicates there might be an association, but is this evidence strong enough? We can test whether this association exists in the population by performing a hypothesis test. To do this, we must write two competing hypotheses. The null hypothesis states that sex is not associated with alcohol use, while the alternative hypothesis states that sex is associated with alcohol use. When testing associations between categorical variables, we always write the hypotheses in words and not symbols. Recall that the null hypothesis always indicates no effect or no difference, and in this case, no association between these variables. A contingency table of the observed counts of sex by alcohol use is shown. In the table, sex is on the columns and alcohol use is on the rows. This table includes both row and column totals, which are the final row and final column, respectively, and the total sample size, which is 253. The table corroborates what we saw in the stacked bar chart, specifically that the number and proportion of males that were heavy drinkers was higher than for the females, and that a larger proportion of females describe themselves as light drinkers than males. This last observation is more obvious in this table. The null hypothesis states that there is no association. If this is the case, then the expected counts should reflect identical percent distributions for males and females that are equal to the overall percent distribution. For example, 47.4% of all participants were moderate drinkers. If there's no association between alcohol use and sex, then the percent of females and males that should be moderate drinkers is 47.4%. We can calculate the expected count using the equation shown. To find an expected count, it's the product of the row and column total over the total sample size. For example, if we wanted to calculate the expected number of females that are moderate drinkers, we would take the product of 160, the row total, and 120, the column total, and divide this by the total sample size, 253. This works out to be 75.89. This is exactly 47.4% of all females, the values we would expect if the null hypothesis is true. This is how we would calculate the expected counts for each cell in the table. Notice that in every case, it's the row total multiplied by the column total divided by the sample size. This table is called the expected counts table, and for each row in the table, the percent of females and males for a certain category, such as moderate drinkers, are identical. In this case, for moderate drinkers, those, those percents that are male and female are both 47.4%. Now that we have the observed counts, the top table, the values that we observed in our sample, and the expected counts, the bottom table, the values that we would expect in our sample if there was no association between sex and alcohol use, 
we can calculate the chi-squared test. Recall that the chi-squared test adds up all the squared differences and standardizes, divides, them by their expected count for each cell in the table. Here, we do the actual work to calculate the chi-square statistic. For female abstainers, the first number, we observe 20 participants that fit this category. We expected 20.29 if sex and alcohol use were unrelated. We calculate this difference, square it, and then divide by 20.29 to standardize the difference. We repeat this for female, light, moderate, and heavy drinkers, as well as for male, abstainers, light, moderate, and heavy drinkers. We then add all these standardized squared differences together and get the chi-square test statistic, which is 11.961. At this point, we know that the statistic follows a chi-square distribution, if the null hypothesis is true, but we don't yet know the degrees of freedom. Again, we have the observed counts table. Notice that we have four rows and two columns of data. Excluding the final row and column, which are just the sum of the rows and columns respectively. If we cover up the last row and the last column of data, excluding the totals, do you know what these numbers have to be? Yes. For, heavy female, for, he, for female heavy drinkers, it'll be 151, the total number of females, minus 20, the number of female abstainers, 60, the number of female light drinkers, and 66, the number of moderate drinkers. Doing this math will give us back five. We can calculate all the values in the last row and column using just the avail information available elsewhere in the table. This is related to the idea of degrees of freedom. Formally, if we have R numbers of rows and C number of columns, then the product of R minus one and C minus one will be our degrees of freedom. The minus refers to the fact that we can cover up a row and a column. In this case, we have four rows and two columns, so it'll be four minus one times two, uh, four minus one times two minus one, or three times one, or three. To calculate the p-value, we go to stat key. Under theoretical distributions, select the chi-square distribution. Enter three for degrees of freedom. Click right tail, because there's always more because that's always the more extreme direction for the chi-square distribution, and set the bottom number to 11.961, the chi-square test statistic we calculated. In this case, we have a p-value of 0 0.0075. We can interpret this p-value as, given there is no association between sex and alcohol use, the probability of observing a chi-square test statistic of 11.961 or more extreme is 0 0.0075. Therefore, it's very unlikely that we would observe this statistic and subsequently these results and our sample if the null hypothesis were in fact true. So what does this say about an association between sex and alcohol use? The small p-value is strong evidence in favor of the alternative hypothesis and against the null hypothesis. The alternative hypothesis is that there is an association, therefore, we can conclude there is an association between sex and alcohol use. If we want to know what categories are driving this association, we can examine the contributions of each cell in the table to the total chi-squared test statistic. This is shown in the final two columns of this table. We see that there were more female and fewer male light drinkers than we would have expected. They are code, color coded red and that there were more male and female, uh, fewer female heavy drinkers than we would have expected if there was no association between sex and alcohol use. These numbers are also color-coded red. This corroborates what we observed in the contingency table. The final slide formalizes the process we just went through. The chi-squared test for association, also known as the chi-squared test of independence, test the relationship between two categorical variables. If we have two categorical variables, which we call A and B, and we let the first categorical variable that we call A have R categories, which we write in the rows of the contingency table, and the second categorical variable 
we will call B, and it has C categories, which we will write in the columns of the contingency table. The null and alternative hypotheses state that there is no association and an association between these two variables, respectively. To compute the chi-square statistic, we need the expected count, which we can find by taking the product of the row and column totals and dividing by the sample size. We then take the squared difference between the observed and expected counts, divided by the expected count for each cell, and add them up to arrive at the chi-square test statistic. A p-value can then be calculated by looking up the location of the calculated test statistic on a chi-square distribution with degrees of freedom equal to r minus 1 times c minus 1. Just like all the tests described, there are necessary conditions for using this test. And like the goodness of fit test, the necessary condition is that each cell in the table is at least 5. If this isn't the case, the categories could be collapsed if they can be done so in a meaningful way or a randomization test should be performed.